Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. If you got your Bible, go to Jeremiah chapter 1. One of the things that when I record an episode for a podcast and I have a guest on or if I'm doing something solo by myself, one of the things that I love to say at the end is I genuinely hope and pray that this episode has encouraged you It has equipped you and it has challenged you. Tonight, I want to encourage you and challenge you. I think you'll get equipped to agree, but more about encouragement and more about challenge. When you look at the screen, you see an older image of Jesus and you see that quotation, you took me too seriously. And I don't want anybody to panic over that. There's a reason behind that quote right there. It's part of an original quote. I'll share it a little bit later, but I really want to remind us as sons and daughters of God, you weren't born into this world by an accident. Even though there may have been people in your life that said you were a mistake or you were an error, it doesn't have to be the definition of your life. The fact that you're here and you're breathing is another reminder that God has purpose in your life. You were created with purpose. And regardless of the path you've been on this moment in time, whatever decisions or choices, whatever the case may be, Wherever you're at, God still has the same purpose created in your life. Everyone in this room and everyone that is listening to this ought to be reminded of how worthy you are to our Father. He knew you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. And he didn't look at you on the day of your conception or the day of your birth and go, "Uh uh-oh, what am I going to do with them now? No, even though they might have been difficulties and trials and tests and failures and disappointments, God still looks at you at this moment in time and believes with every ounce of who he is as creator, I still created you with a purpose. I still created you with a destiny. Each and every person may not have the same assignment as everyone else in this room, but it doesn't mean that your life is not marked by assignment. Jeremiah chapter 1, again, I I love this. It'll make sense a little bit later why I titled this, You Took Me Too Seriously. (laughs) I promise. Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, O Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See how I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now just hold your uh, page there in Jeremiah because we're going to read more scripture in a moment. Jeremiah's story here in chapter 1 is like many of us. 
Whenever we have that aha moment that God really did create us with a purpose, we have this tendency to make up these excuses or reasons why we can't do what we're supposed to do. I'm too young, I'm too old, I can't speak plainly. Moses did that, Moses said, I can't speak. And God told Moses, don't worry about it. That's why I gave you your brother Aaron. But how many times did Aaron speak for Moses? Not a single time. But we're all guilty of this. At some point in our life, we're guilty of giving God a reason why he made a mistake. God, you really didn't anoint me. God, you really didn't call me. God, you did. You really, no one wants to hear me sing. No one wants to hear me preach. No one wants to hear me, or I don't have the words to pray. One of the things, like when you teach people um, evangelistic uh, tools, like evangelism one-on-one, you'll hear people say, I don't know what to say, or I'm afraid that I'll mess up. And when I hear that, I always look at the people and say, don't worry whether or not you mess up. Lost people don't know that you messed up. They don't know, so don't worry about it. If you say the wrong thing, don't, it's okay. Because when you're witnessing to someone, Holy Spirit is the one actually doing the work, not your words. Your words have power, and your words is effective, but no man comes to the Father except he goes to the Son, their first being a what? An eloquent speech? an elegant prayer, someone who said everything right. No, unless there's a conviction of Holy Spirit. I wonder if we went across the room tonight, what would our excuses be why we're not fulfilling the assignment of our life? What's holding us really back? What's keeping us from doing what we're supposed to be doing in the kingdom of God? Everybody has this mentality that I don't have a ministry unless I'm on a platform. That's the first lie. The moment you said, yes, Lord, you have ministry. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and what? Make disciples. You make disciples every day of your life, whether you recognize it or not. And the real question is, are you making good ones or bad ones? Because every day your life is a testimony of what God has done for you and what he's doing through you and what he'll continue to do for you. But if you go to work and you nag or you complain or you gripe and you criticize and you harp and you gossip and you slander, no wonder nobody wants Christ. No wonder that it's, it's, it's a battle a lot of times. We hear Jeremiah's excuse Many of us would say, I'll never do anything like that. Lord, if you call me. Well, let's, let's think about this. How many people has God ever created throughout the history of time, all the way up to this moment right now, how many people did he create destined for hell? Not a one. God doesn't create and send people to hell, contrary to what some people choose to believe. Why do we know that? The scripture's clear. God's desire is that every man would come to the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. So God creates everyone, male and female, and he creates them for the purpose that they would serve him because of the relationship of the son. So God didn't create you to damn you. God didn't create you to curse you. God didn't create you to criticize you. God didn't create you to punish you. God created you because there's purpose in your life. Many of us aren't fulfilling the purpose because we're living a life of limitations based on excuses. But I still believe that God is still, this very day, looking for a generation that will be sold out and who are willing to walk with him no matter the cost. Here recently, we saw the debacle in Afghanistan and we saw men and women of God who had to lay their life down at the mercy of a regime that is evil, and they laid their life down willingly because they thought and believed that it was something worth dying for 
And yet we have people that get mad and leave the church every single day in this nation because someone said something about them on social media. Or the pastor didn't shake my hand or didn't look my way, didn't appreciate my gifts and my talent. We have to ask ourselves, who are we really serving in the kingdom? Is man your king or is the one that sits on the throne your king? Psalms 24, verse 6 through 10 is one of my favorite passages of scriptures. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. <clears throat> Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. I know we want to play politics, politics in our time. We want to make sure that our political figure is sitting in a place of authority. But I go back and I read Psalms 24 and there's something that reignites in me that the king has never left his post. He didn't have to be elected in. It didn't have to be a blue wave or a red wave. It didn't have to be a certain political agenda. He spoke into the existence and created. And the fact that he spoke and the earth became formed, the vastness of space, the stars, the moon, the sun, the fact that he created every living thing and living creature and then turned around and said, let us make man in our image and likeness is something that fires me up because I realize if he did all that, he didn't make a mistake when he created us. John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Now, I know when we read that passage of scripture, when we're not going through a trial, when we're not going through a test, when we're not going through tribulation, we all say, amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But when you're in a trial, or you're in a test, or you're in tribulation, we ain't walking around going, I'm gonna be a good cheer because Jesus overcome the world. We're all struggling. But it's why there are times it is more important to get back into the word of God and remind yourself what he has already declared over you instead of running to every Tom, Dick, and Harry and getting their opinion about who you are. He created you. And when he created you, even the son said, you will have trials, tribulation, tests, hardship, difficult, whatever it is. But he said, I want to remind you, when those moments come, be of good cheer because I've overcome them. The Amplified Version says it this way. I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. <laughs> in the world you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. I like to camp out in frustration sometimes, I admit that. I have to work on that. But be of good cheer. I love this, how they amplified. Take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. There's something about that verse in that version that something, even though you don't feel like it, even though you feel the attacks of the enemy, even though you may feel down in the moment, there's something about reading that verse and recognizing, wait a minute, what I'm going through has already been stamped, gone through. We have the tendency to camp out in our tribulations. 
We have a tendency to camp out in our trials, our distress, our frustration. It's kind of like when Art was talking a couple of Wednesday nights ago about coming out of the wilderness. Over 24 years of ministry, I've come across so many people that says, I'm just in the wilderness. I'm like, dear God, get out of the wilderness. It is not a place to camp out. I mean, first of all, have you read the Old Testament? They were in the wilderness wandering because of disobedience. Number one, not a good place to be. Number two, Jesus went there to be endued with power from Holy Spirit, but he didn't camp out there. But there's people, you know, you just, you learn with some people. You don't ask them, how are you doing? You just, hey, then you catch that tongue because they're waiting for you to ask so they can bleh all over you. (laughs) Jesus declared he overcame it. Now, again, I I don't think you you walk around and you're just like, oh, I'm just gonna be a good chief. I get it, there's struggles, I get all that. You know, James said to count it all joy. Years ago, my mother She called me one day and she said, are you telling me that I'm supposed to go to the mailbox and get that electric bill and come back doing cartwheels saying, count it all joy, count it all joy. And I said, no, mom, I'm not saying that, but I am saying you ought to be joyful that you got the money to pay the bill. And because you've got it, it's helping provide for your family and this and that. Count it all joy. Not saying it's easy, I'm just saying it's possible. There are many today who are more passionate about useless and insignificant moments in life that continue to give itself satisfying pleasures that ultimately only make us spiritually weak. They've accepted the lies and the manipulation of the enemy. They're people who just can't seem to really tap into what God has for them. We really need sons and daughters of God who refuse to back down according to the word. We need people to recognize the truth that God, even in the battle, has already won the war. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads for what reason? That the king of glory may come in. You know, when Jesus goes back to the Father, One of the most beautiful images is the fact that he goes back to the Father and he sits down. He sits down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down as a priest, but not just a priest. He sat down as the high priest. The high priest could never, ever sit down until the work on the Day of Atonement was completed And the high priest had to declare that the work was finished in order for him to sit down. The high priest said something just as Jesus said something when he declared, it is finished. Why do I believe that God heals? It is finished. Why do I believe that God delivers? It is finished. Why do I believe that he still sets captives and the oppressed free? Because it is finished. Why do I believe that blind eyes and deaf ears can be opened? Because it is finished. Why do I believe that the biggest sinner on the face of the earth can still cry out to a loving and a merciful God and receive Jesus as his Savior? Because it is finished. There are many today who understand the work of the cross. But honestly, they fail to understand the power of his resurrection. There's, you know, a popular song some time ago by Misty Edwards, but she's absolutely right. He's not a baby in a manger anymore. He's not a broken man on a cross. He didn't stay in the grave and he's not staying in heaven forever. There are people who still 
Pray to sweet baby Jesus, nine pound, five ounces. Sweet baby Jesus. That's how they see Jesus. There are people that pray to the man that's on the cross. But last time I read my word, he served on this earth for 30 years, served in ministry per se for three to three and a half years, but he's been in intercession for over 2,000 years, and there'll be a moment when he steps out of intercession to step foot on the Mount of Olives and turn this thing upside down. We have to have men and women of God who are willing to please God rather than to entertain men. The truth is you will find people who don't mind knowing that you are loving, you're kind, you're meek. But the moment you become holy and zealous, you've gone too far for their style of Christianity. Leonard Ravenhill once said, many pastors criticize me for taking the gospel so seriously. But do they really think that on judgment day, Christ will chastise me saying, Leonard, you took me too seriously. I love that quote. I, if you know me, I'm a huge Linda Ravenhill fan. But I love that quote. Because it's so true. The moment that you choose to burn after God, to live a righteous and a holy life, to come to corporate prayer meetings, to show up at revival meetings, to attend family groups or life groups or or just all night prayer, worship, 24 hour burns. The moment that you become zealous after the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there will always be some jack leg Christian that will be there to tell you, you just need to calm down. I remember when I was your age and I burned for God too. You just need to calm down. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. There's some fruit loops out there. And there's some, we become zealous over the craziest things sometimes. I had years ago, somebody asked me, what do you think about gold teeth happening in people's mouths? I said, I don't have an explanation for it. And if it happens, awesome. If it happens in my mouth, I'm going to two places, the dentist and the pawn shop. I can't explain it, but I can tell you this, I'm not chasing after it. Some people are chasing after little feathers and jewels. Some people are chasing demons. I've never had to chase a demon. You show up and have Christ in you, demons will arrive. You don't have to chase demons. But I'm talking about the holiness and the righteousness of Christ, seeking him in order to be obedient. What does that cost? Regardless of any personal desires or circumstances, what does that cost in our life? to say, yes, Lord, no matter the cost, no matter the, the, the trouble. Now, I'm gonna tell you, for years I read the book of Jeremiah and I thought, this is the biggest baby on the face of the earth. He's always crying. Now, my family goes, hypocrite, because I can cry at the drop of a hat. I cry at commercials. True story. When they show the daddy in the wedding store and his daughter's getting a wedding dress and she's a little girl, that's cruel. That's a cruel commercial. I cry when Andy has to discipline Opie. I, I just, I'm, I'm an emotional person, I can cry. I just, it's just, it's just I don't know, it's a little hypocritical. Ryan, Jeremiah cried all the time. Why are you being so hypocritical? I just thought, man, this guy cannot get it together. Then one day I'm reading Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is at Caesarea Philippi, right? He's at the false god of Pan. He has the disciples there. And he says, who do they say that I am? That's the first question. Who do they say that I am? Well, some say that you're the prophets of old. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. We all look at that and go, I get it. 
Hey, have you read Matthew 16 lately? It also says, some say you're Jeremiah. What kind of life did Jeremiah live that when Jesus was on the work, on, on the earth doing his work of the Father, that when people saw Jesus, they thought it was Jeremiah? So then I have to go back and look at Jeremiah's life and go, what am I missing? And you realize he's weeping out of compassion. He's compassionate for the people because of their lack of relationship with God. And he's having to come into some places and deliver some hard words. But how important is his obedience to his purpose? Look at chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, the evil will be unleashed on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of north, declares the Lord. And they will come and place each one of them, his throne at the entrance of the gate of Jerusalem and against all the walls around and against all the cities of Judah. And I will pronounce my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Since they have abandoned me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands, now belt your garment around your waist and arise and speak to them all that I have commanded you. Do not be dismayed before them or I will make you dismayed before them. Now behold, I have made you today like a fortified city and like a pillar of iron and walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its leaders, to its priests, and to the people of the land. And they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I'm with you to save you, declares the Lord. Now listen, we could break all that down, but I'm not going to break that down tonight. Here's what I want you to understand in this part right here. What would have happened if Jeremiah simply said no? What would have happened if even after God told him how he was created with this purpose, he was anointed for this, and Jeremiah still said no? What would have happened to the people? I want us to understand all over this room, you may not be called in the same manner of Jeremiah, but you need to understand that your no has consequences. And your yes has consequences. There's times you're gonna have to be saying no, but are you saying no for the right reason? Versus saying yes for the obedient reason. But think about this moment in Jeremiah. He gets this understanding, the enemy's coming. The enemy is coming. But you are a fortified city. And I have overcome. Let me put it in terms so that we'll understand today. Ryan? You're going to suffer great financial loss. But I got you. You don't know when. You don't know how. But I'm going to return what was stolen with interest. Oh, I would get that and run with that. What if it was, hey, the enemy's trying to attack your body. And it's going to look bad in the natural. But I've already overcome it because I've attached my super to the natural. We would look at that and go, whoa, this is what I'm saying. Your yes has unlocking authority. 
But I understand. And a lot of times, the bigger problem is our view of who God is. Again, like Misty Edwards' song, baby in a manger, broken man on a cross, he's in a grave. There's many people that just struggle. You'll learn when people don't have a good home life, a lot of times a father's not around, they grow up to be adults, and they struggle having a relationship with God because they had a bad example of an earthly father. It happens. Sometimes it happens in relationships, marriages. Bad example, they equate it. But who is God to you really? Who is he to you according to the word? Well, since you asked, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord who is present, the Lord our healer, the Lord our righteousness, the Lord our provider, the Lord our banner, the Lord our peace. He is avenger, he is Abba, he is almighty, he is anointed one, he is beginning, he's bread of life, he's bright and morning story, he's the captain of salvation. He's the chief shepherd, the chosen one, the comforter, the consuming fire, the crown of beauty, deliverer, desired of all nations, eternal God, eternal life, everlasting father. He's excellent, he's faithful and true. He's father, he's fortress, he's friend, he's God almighty, he's God over all. He's goodness, he's great high priest, he's God, he's heir of all things, he's holy one, he's hope, he's horn of salvation. I am Emmanuel, Jehovah. Judge, King, King of Glory, King of Saints, King of Jews, Leader, Life, Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Living God, Lord of all, Love, Maker, Merciful God, Mighty One, Omega, Portion, Potter, Prince of Life, Propitiation, Redeemer, Refuge, Righteous One, Savior, Servant, Shield, Strength, Strong Tower, True Light, The One, The Vine, The Way, and Wonderful. That's just a few things. That's not even all the things that He is. That's just a few things. But then there's the other side of the coin. You may not struggle in understanding who God is, but you understand in, you struggle in understanding who you are. When I was a kid, I used to hear people say, I'm just a worthless sinner. Saved by grace. And they'd cry and they'd weep. I understood what they were saying as an adult now, I understood but it really painted a, a misconception about who they are as sons of God. We have this mentality that we walk around all the time saying, well, we're just a bunch of sinners. You know, the word of God says you're a saint. As sons of God. But we struggle with that. We go, man, I don't know if I can ever be called a saint. Well, that's what the word of God says. Well, I'm just worthless. Are you? Because the word of God says you're to be worthy and understand that you are worthy because of Christ in you. So who are you to him? According to the word of God, you're a friend. You're justified. You're redeemed. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're an heir. You're accepted. You're a new creation. You're set free. You're chosen. You're holy. You're blameless before him. You're forgiven. You're made alive in Christ, with Christ. You're seated in heavenly places. You are the light in the Lord. You're the citizen of heaven, made complete. You're a dwelling for Holy Spirit. You're a holy temple. You're a minister of reconciliation. You're a saint. You're adopted as his child. You're born of God, and the evil one cannot harm you. You are dead to sin. You're delivered. You're you're faithful, you're God's co-worker, you're his disciple, you're more than a conqueror, you're no longer condemned, you're not alone, you're not helpless or in want, you're protected, you're qualified, you're raised up, you're safe, you're salt and light, you're secure, you're victorious, you're strong, you have been called, you have been established, you have been anointed, you have been sealed, you have God's power, you have God's hope, you have God's peace, you have God's purpose, you have God's redemption, you have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And that's just a little bit. That's not even all of it. And here's the kicker. You did nothing to get it except say yes. That's it. You said yes, Lord. I do not want to be saved simply just to make it to heaven. When I was a lot younger, I would say, I don't care. As long as I get on the inside of the gates and I have to cut the grass at the gates with a pair of scissors. That was a stupid mentality. I'm just being honest about that. Because then you realize we're laying up treasures in heaven for ourselves to lay at his feet. 
you're acting like it's okay to enter his presence with a Burger King crown. When he's got a real crown with real jewels that the earth can't even comprehend. And you're going to lay it at his feet and declare him holy. And he's going to try to put it back on you. But when you put it back on you, you're still going to understand who he is. And you're going to take it off and lay it at his feet again. I know in earth we love to tip God and act like we're doing something, but I'm telling you, in eternity, the reason we're doing what we're doing on this earth is for his glory and his glory alone. I don't want to be saved from sin simply so that I can be some God-directed man that everybody just finds over. You know, no one, I get it. No one's going to hear my voice and go, oh, he speaks elegantly. I get that. You hear the country hick in my voice. I understand that. But that's why God knows the intentions of my heart and knows the depth of my words. And the culture may be trying to redefine words right now, but the kingdom knows the heart. This moment can truly be a turning point in your life if you'll simply not just decide not to go to the cross, but to pick up your cross. I've seen people over the years, every altar call, they're there weeping at the altar. And that's beautiful. I don't ever want to not see that. But if all you do is share, shed tears at the foot of the cross. You need to learn how to pick up the cross and weep while you're climbing the hill with the cross. Crucify our flesh. Crucify our pettiness. Crucify our jealousy. Crucify our anger. Crucify our bitterness. Crucify our unforgiveness. Crucify our tongue. If you ever really feel good about yourself, go back and read James. James will humble you quickly for the right reason. We got to get rid of the erratic lifestyle that we live as a Christian, but we deem it as acceptable Christianity. If you're burning for his glory today, you ought to be burning more this time next year. But the question is, will you even be here next year? Because so many times we get saved, we're on fire, we're baptized, we're whatever, and three months we're doing good. No slew foot comes in and convinces us of these lies and manipulations. We sell into it and we walk away from the true calling and the purpose of our life. But I'm telling you right now, the world doesn't need another political figure. The world, the earth is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to come back. We need men and women of God who will stand up and say, I will take this seriously. Where are those who will say, come and die so that I may live? It is sad when we have a mindset that we have to show how spiritual we are by the things that we don't do instead of proving ourselves through the things that we do supernaturally. As the world is redefining words, it's also demanding that the church redefine who God is. But God's already ordained. One of my other favorite quotes by Raven Hill is, the world is not looking for another explanation of Christianity, the world is looking for the demonstration. 
The world, I mean, the Lord wants to bring you into glory that you and I have yet to tap into. God isn't looking at our lives tonight and he's, he's looking all over this room and those listening to this, he's not saying, well, you've gone as far as you can go with me. No, he's saying, come a little higher. I got some more. Serve more, love more, honor more, walk in righteousness more, walk in holiness, holiness more. And I know we wanna look at holiness and righteousness and call it religion but that's not religion. Be holy because I am holy is not a suggestion. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it's not a suggestion. <laughs> I wanna see something that God establishes, not what man promotes. I wanna be with people who are hungry for God, not what man wants to nibble on. We have tried so many schemes in the American church, every fancy idea. We've copied, we've cut, copied, and pasted what's successful in some areas, and we believe it to be successful simply because we do it like everyone else. Mankind has this tendency to demand loyalty with the hope of a relationship, while the Father requires faithfulness because of the relationship. If you will learn to be faithful to him, the reward of faithfulness is greater than anything that we could ever get from mankind. Now's the time more than ever, we've talked about this a lot, but now's the time more than ever, we need somebody to come down. <laughs> we need some person. Who could it be? We need a Holy Ghost invasion just like Mary got in the womb. When it was impossible for something to be created out of nothing, there was a creation of something supernaturally. We need Holy Spirit to come down again and move past visitation into habitation so that Christ in us, we recognize, is the hope of glory. So let me say it like this. Worship team, you can come back, please. And I know we say, I, I really want you to understand, Holy Spirit is a person. The is not the first name. I know we say the Holy Spirit, but honestly, it's Holy Spirit. God the Father, Christ the Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit. One of the craziest things to understand in the scripture is Jesus is, he's with the disciples and he keeps telling the disciples, I've got to go. And what's one of the reasons he said, the main reason he said, I've got to go so that he may come and do in you what I cannot do. Now that's hard to fathom. But Jesus had to leave this earth for a greater increase of the Father and the Son in you. It's one of those things, and I don't know who originally said it, so I can't give credit to it, but you know, it's like so many times we say, when I die and I go to heaven, I want to talk to Adam and ask like, why'd you do what you did? I want to talk to Noah. Did you have to let snakes on the ark? You know, we might be able to talk to the men and women in the Old Testament probably after about 10,000 years at being at the Father's feet. Because I promise you, that's the first place you're going to be and you're not going to want to move for a while. You might eventually get to somebody. But the truth is, you think of somebody like David. More than likely, David wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to him. Because David wants to know, what was it like to have his spirit in you? What was it like to have his spirit not just leave? 
remain. I was in prayer last night and I said, Lord, I really don't know how to land the plane on this. And the Lord said, ask for a renewal. And, and, you know, initially I thought, okay, I think I understand. But then I immediately said, don't you mean a refreshing? And again, I heard the word renewal. So I'm like, okay, what, what am I missing? So I have to go and I go do this word search. I want you to hear this. You know, Romans 12, 2 talks about the renewing of your mind. That's one of the four types of Greek words for renewal. In particular, Romans 12, 2, it means the adjustment of the moral and the spiritual vision, the thinking of the mind, which is designed to have a transforming effect upon the life. When I first read that, I went, oh, I get it. Because this is what we're really after, changing the way that we really think about God and ourselves so that we may understand our created purpose. But then I kept reading. I'll quickly go to this. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing by Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And I love this. This statement is trustworthy. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for people. Titus 3 verse 5, the renewing of Holy Spirit is not a fresh uh, release of the Spirit, but it's a revival of His power. A revival of His power developing the Christian life. This passage stresses, stresses the continual operation of the indwelling, indwelling Spirit of God. Stresses the willing response on the part of the believer. Oh, there it is. My question tonight is, who in this room needs a renewal of Holy Spirit? A revival of His power. The development of a Christian life. Stand to your feet all over this room. I don't want anybody to do anything that they don't believe they should do. If you don't believe you should do it, don't do it. But you know, we are preparing for a special service on Sunday. What is it? It's a healing service. You and I don't have the ability to heal anyone. It's not by my name. It's not by your name. It's not by your power or my power. However, he that is in us, I believe tonight is a cultivating the ground night. See, because we know real life circumstances right now and, and you know, people are saying it doesn't look good in the natural. I know what the natural looks like, but I also know what my kingdom reality looks like. 
See, even with my son, some of you know this deal with my oldest son who recent, uh, last year type one diabetic and not long ago diagnosed celiac disease. I know what the doctor said. And I don't deny what they said. I don't try to act like they didn't say it. I simply say, that's your truth according to medicine. This is my reality because His truth lives in me. I'm asking all over this room. See, I'm believing that Sunday morning you won't have to wait on an altar call. You'll be in your chairs and all of a sudden the Spirit of God come upon you know that you're supposed to go lay hands on the person sitting beside you and you just know that healing can come through you for them. See, what we're missing in our culture right now is the power of God. I want the power of God again. I've seen it before with other people. All it did was make me hungry for more of His glory. I've never healed anybody. To be truthful, I've never delivered anybody. I've never saved anybody. I've never set anyone free. But because He's in me, I got to be a part of it. Because when He created me and He created you, He said, look what I'm about to do through this one right here. When He created Daniel, He said He he may not fully understand it, but He'll lay hands on the blind and the blind eyes will open up. When he created Shelly, she may not fully understand it, but when she sings, there'll be a healing balm anointing go out through those that hear. When Margie is praying with people, at times she'll feel like she has nothing to say but my presence because she carries my presence. I've created her to be a carrier of my presence. And when the words feel like they're falling to the ground, I'll make sure they never hit the ground because my presence will maintain thus that I say. You are created with purpose. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.